most people who know anything about Madagascar don't know about Fusa. Madagascar's famous as the home of the lemurs, but there's a top of the food chain in this country too, and and and, and that's the Fusa. The Fusas are, are, you can think of it as a really big mongoose that looks like a cougar. I'm Dr. Luke Dollar. I'm an American wildlife biologist, and I've been working in Madagascar for almost 20 years. Earthwatch has supported my work in Madagascar on the FUSA, which is the largest carnivore in Madagascar, and the conservation and development work that we've been doing there for well over a dozen years with Earthwatch Partnership. And I'm here at the Royal Geographic Society tonight to talk about all of that work, and I'm very excited to be here. It's got feline equipment, like claws. Um, but it's got the attitude of a mongoose, like Ricky Ticky Tavi. And that combination of factors makes that single large carnivore predator be able to maintain that trophic level for all of the ecosystems in Madagascar, whether it's rainforest or dry forest or spiny forest. There's one mammal at the top of the food chain, and that's a fusa. The fusa, which is the largest carnivore on Madagascar, was virtually unknown until a couple of decades ago. It had been first described in the 1850s, but until very recently there were no studies about its habits, its diet, uh, its size, its threats. We know Madagascar is in a conservation conundrum as a result of uh, human population growth and rapid deforestation. But how that impacts the FUSA is a question that we've been able to ask now that we've answered the initial questions about FUSA not only being nocturnal but being active both day and night. That they're not just eating lemurs, they're eating just about everything in the forest with a heartbeat. We know how much habitat they require to, to go about their, their daily lives and maintain a home range, you know, more than 10 square kilometers, so, so a large tract of land. But what we've been able to do most recently is look at the conservation threats beyond just the natural history, looking at things like the impacts of invasive uh, animal species going into the forest, things like feral dogs, not only as direct competitors, but indirect competitors and indirect threats through disease transfer. First, uh, we set out to just answer basic natural history questions. How many there are? How much home range they need? What their diet is? What their daily activity patterns are? Once we answered those, we've gone on to answer ecosystem level questions that aren't necessarily based just in the species itself, but based in its habitat and the environment in which it engages. We've looked at forest cover change over many decades using old imagery and current imagery to, to track what the trends were and address what the most acute threats at present are so that we can seek to um, engage local people and maybe head off a loss of a critical corridor or a critical patch of habitat that we need to maintain FUSA in the long term. Now Madagascar has 20 million people. Three quarters of those people are rural. The vast majority of those rural people are subsistence farmers. They have to clear land to grow rice, to eat, to survive. Now, in many cases now, that land is in protected areas. That's FUSA habitat, as well as it's places that, that people need to, to grow food to eat. By finding an alternative to that slash and burn agriculture through things like ecotourism or research assistance or uh, other development programs, we're able to, to, to mitigate the potential human impacts on FUSA habitat and in the long run make lives better for not only the people, but the FUSA as well. People need to grow rice in order to survive. There's very little return per unit effort in predator biology. We have trap lines set across very long and very big areas that have to be checked twice a day. The only way to do that is on foot. The only way to get there is through hiking. And so Earthwatch volunteers first and foremost are checking trap lines. They're uh, going from trap to trap to trap. As they're walking the trap line, it's also an ecological census. So they're collecting data on all of the prey items that may be a part of the FUSA menu as they're doing so. Now, having done this in this area since 1999, we've created a long-term biodiversity database, not only for FUSA, but for all of the things that may be on the FUSA menu. And we know from our studies that FUSA eat everything with a heartbeat. So we can actually use this data set now to look at trends in bird populations, lemur populations, micromammal populations, in addition to the carnivores that are our target species, which benefits park management. We can tell the park service, you know, this is what we're, what we're noticing. You know, your ground bird population in this particular area is going way down. 
what's hammering those ground birds in an area, and then they're able to intervene to address that threat that immediately has nothing to do with FUSA, but certainly has to do with the balance of nature as a whole in the protected area. Well, what the Earthwatch volunteers take back, they all come to work on the science project. They know they're going to collect data. They know they're going to work with, with biodiversity. They're going to work with wildlife. And that's what brings them to Madagascar. But the memories that they cherish most when they go home may have something to do with the wildlife, but more often than not, the greatest and most cherished memories involve the interactions with the local people. Um, Madagascar is known for the wildlife, but the human population is very special. It's very culturally rich, and the people are warm. They are very friendly. They're very engaging. And you know, not only them as individuals, but their, but their, but their music and their crafts are something that, that people come to, to learn about and appreciate. The question that we're addressing here tonight, do protected areas do anything to conserve, to protect biodiversity? Um, is, is a very serious question, but it's a very simple question based on my own experience. Based on my own experience, protected areas themselves do not protect species. People protect species. People who come to a place that may be facilitated by protection for an area make the difference. Putting a line on paper is just that, a line on paper. Feet and boots on the ground interacting person to person is what makes a difference in the ultimate fate of everything that lives and breathes in a protected area and that's what Earthwatch is all about. Putting people in the places where wildlife and conservation is needed and making a difference.